Hi, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, whatever time it is. Welcome to episode 108, I think it is, of Left Side of the Aisle. I'm your host, my name's Larry Erickson, and for the next almost half hour, I'm going to be talking about things important to me I think are worthy of your attention. If you have any reactions to the show, you can contact me directly at Hoviating, W-H-O-V-I-A-T-I-N-G at AOL.com. And if you didn't catch that, my website, Lotus Surviving a Dark Time. You can go there. You can get the uh, email address directly from there. Uh, If you do email me, I only ask that you be a little patient about getting a reply. You will get one. And um, please include something like left side of the aisle or your cable show or something like that in the subject line so we know it's not spam. All right, with those uh, by now traditional intros out of the way, we're going to get right to it. And we're going to start with, um, as I always like to start when the opportunity arises, with some good news. On May 2nd, uh, Governor Lincoln Chafee of Rhode Island, he took to the steps of the State House and said, quoting, I am proud to say that now, at long last, you are free to marry the person you love. He then signed into law Rhode Island's recognition of same-sex marriage. Uh, With the addition of Rhode Island, there were then 10 states plus the District of Columbia where same-sex couples could get married. Five days later, on May 7th, Delaware became the 11th state to legalize same-sex marriage. Governor Jack Markle signed the legislation into law immediately after the legislature passed it, saying to the crowd, I do not intend to make any of you wait one minute longer. And exactly a week after that, on May 14th, Governor Mark Dayton of Minnesota signed a measure passed the day before by the state legislature, making Minnesota the 12th state and the third in less than two weeks to recognize same-sex marriage. It was also the first state in the Midwest to do so by legislative vote. In fact, as part of this, the mayor of St. Paul, Minnesota, uh, ordered a downtown bridge decorated with the gay pride flags, the rainbow flags, and temporarily renamed it the Freedom to Marry Bridge and proclaimed Freedom to Marry Week. Meanwhile, uh, Minnesota's most famous opponent of same-sex marriage, uh, Representative Michelle Bonkersman, the ambassador to Earth from the Ori, Uh, claimed that the vote, quote, denies religious liberty to people who believe in traditional marriage, which only goes to prove that for people like her, religious liberty means the ability to force other people to believe the same things you do. Well, you can believe this, people. This is one. It may be the only one, but on this one, we're winning. Oh, by the way, a footnote to the Minnesota vote. Brian Brown, who's the president of the anti-gay hate group, the National Organization for Marriage, was left splattering that you'd better get an anti-same-sex marriage uh, provision in your state constitution or otherwise, quote, the powerful and wealthy gay marriage lobby will target your state for their next campaign. Now, talking about all those wealthy gays is kind of odd, coming as it does from a man who makes $508,000 a year for his own politicking. But then again, recognizing how odd that is would require a little bit of uh, self-reflection, so I really don't think there's any danger of that. Uh, Another bit of good news, and this actually may even be a little more controversial than same-sex marriage, but I think it's good news. On May 13th, the Vermont legislature gave final passage to what is usually called a death with dignity bill, also known as an assisted suicide bill. The governor has promised to sign it. The new law allows doctors to help terminally ill patients die by prescribing lethal doses of medications to patients with six months or less to live. Now, the rules are rather strict. The patient has to request it, of course. In fact, they have to request it on at least three separate occasions. They must get a second medical opinion to confirm the prognosis. They must be offered a psychiatric examination, and they have to wait 17 days to fill the prescription. Vermont, something to my surprise, is the fourth state uh, to have such a death with dignity procedure. A court ordered Montana and ballot initiatives in Washington and Oregon instilled, uh, installed the practice in those states. Now, a big concern of opponents of the idea of, of death with dignity is that it may end lives necessarily, unnecessarily, that uh, people might prove to outlive the prognosis, or worse, they may have been misdiagnosed in the first place. But the experience of Washington State should help allay those fears. Uh, since this was instituted there in 2010, only 255 people 
have obtained a prescription for the lethal doses and a number of them never filled it. So the prospect that this would be a lightly considered or not well considered option that people would take really doesn't seem to be a, a legitimate concern. All right, so we're going to go from the good news to um, the bad news. We have two RIPs this week. The first is to Ray Harryhausen, the master of stop motion animation. He died last week in London. He was 92. You may not have heard his name, but if any of these pictures mean anything to you, um, you know his work. Often working with a small crew or even alone, he created and photographed uh, a lot of the most memorable fantasy adventure creatures in movie history. Uh, the dinosaur and the beast from 20,000 Fathoms, the skeleton warriors and Jason and the Argonauts, the pterodactyl in 1 million years BC, the alien beast in 20 million miles to Earth, and many, many more dating all the way back to Mighty Joe Young. Uh, he developed a way which he called dynamation to, for his models to appear to interact directly with the actors. George Lucas, Steven, Sp uh, Steven Spielberg, uh, James Cameron, Peter Jackson, all of these people have pointed to um, Ray Harryhausen as an antecedent for their own work. Per me, I just remember the fun of watching his movies. So R.I.P. Harry uh, uh, Ray Harryhausen. The other RIP this week is for Dr. Joyce Brothers, the mother of media psychology who turned a victory on the TV game show The $64,000 Question into a decades-long career popularizing psychology through radio, TV, and a syndicated newspaper column. She was 85. I remember encountering Dr. Joyce Brothers on the TV when I was quite young. She had a five-minute show, which was tagged on the end of something else, I don't remember what, and she would answer a mailed-in viewer question, and she'd do it while she sat stiffly and quite properly behind a desk, square-shouldered, facing the camera directly, just like this, speaking the entire time. I actually thought she was rather creepy. But I grew up and she thought out, and I came to respect what appeared to be her determination to remain open-minded about things. So another part of my childhood slips away. R.I.P. Joyce Brothers. All right, from there, on to one of our regular weekly features, the Clown Award, given as always for acts of meritorious stupidity. The winner of the big red nose this week is that ever-reliable source of bitterly amusing inanity, the DHS, the Department for the Protection of the Fatherland. In this case, it comes in the form of customs agents, part of our frontline troops in the never-ending battle to preserve and protect our forever endangered levels of paranoia. Hussein al kawahir is a 33-year-old Saudi Arabian man. He was arrested at Detroit Metropolitan Airport on May 11th. According to reports, agents at Customs became suspicious of him because apparently a couple of pages were missing from his passport. Um, you know, all right, fair enough, fair enough. So they checked him out, they checked his luggage, fair enough. And then they found it. The item, the thing, the reason for his arrest. He was trying to bring into the United States a pressure cooker. And then he said he lied about why he was doing it. First, the agents claim al Kawahir said he brought it for his nephew, who attends the University of Toledo in Ohio, uh, because the nephew couldn't buy one in the U.S. Well, then later he said he brought the pressure cooker because the one his nephew purchased was cheap and it broke the first time he used it. Oh my gosh, blatant contradictions caught in a lie, and let's not forget, it was a pressure cooker! Let's also not forget that this guy doesn't speak a word of English. So the questions went from English to Arabic through a translator and then from Arabic back to English. Is it really so outrageous of me to think that, um, that maybe in the course of that something got literally got lost in the translation and that maybe uh, his original answer was that, uh, was that his son hadn't been able to buy a decent one in the U.S. or hadn't been able to buy one like this in the U.S. or one that worked in the U.S.? Or are we supposed to think, as customs apparently does, that international terrorists are so stupid that they're trying to smuggle pressure cookers into the United States because they think they can't buy them here. 
And the clownishness of the DHS in this is matched by the clownishness of the media. Most every story I saw on this, and I saw several, but most, most of these stories treated it as if trying to bring a pressure cooker into the United States was itself an illegal act. And every single one of them just had to mention the Boston Marathon bombings. Because, you know, pressure cooker! I mean, this, is, this, 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 this is inane. I mean, really, this is completely, completely, totally inane. The day before, I'll just show you how bad this is, the day before al here was, was arrested, uh, on, I'm still not sure exactly what charge, a young Saudi Arabian man told a Saudi newspaper, uh, he's a, he lives, he's a guy, he's a student, he lives in Michigan. He said that cops had issued him a warning after he was seen outside carrying a pressure cooker full of rice to a friend's house for dinner. Apparently, a neighbor saw this suspicious man with a pressure cooker and called the cops. Cops came to his house. He qu questioned him about his activities in the U.S. when he got here, about what he does outside the university. They examined the pressure cooker and then told him to be careful while handling such items in public. Maybe they should have remembered Richard Reed and Umar uh, Abdulmutallab and warned him about appearing in public wearing shoes or underwear. The Saudi Embassy in Washington uh, reports that a number of Saudi students in the U.S. had their homes raided in the wake of the Boston Marathon bombings. Nothing was found. Meanwhile, Hussein al khawahir remains in prison until a preliminary hearing on May 8th, uh, May, May 28th, rather. We are governed by clowns. All right, from the ridiculous to the outrageous. If you need any more evidence that there is a need for dramatic, dare I say, revolutionary change in our social and economic system, this should do it for you. It's the outrage of the week. On May 13th, President Hopi Chengji and British Prime Minister David Cameron pledged to achieve a new broad trade agreement between the United States and the European Union. But tariffs between the U.S. and the European Union are basically low or non-existent, so what's the point of a new treaty? Well, the point, my friends, is what are called regulatory issues and who gets to decide what the standards are for everything from environmental protection to food safety to worker protection and back again. And the who is just who you might expect. The amazing Mr. O and Cameron are pushing for what's called investor state resolution to be included in any new pact. Now, currently, trade between the U.S. and the EU is governed by the rules of the World Trade Organization, or the WTO. Under those rules, if a corporation feels it has been wronged by some uh, nation's policies regarding trade, it has to persuade a national government to take up that case on their behalf before a WTO court. Under investor state resolution, that's not necessary, and corporations are given the political power to sue governments directly. And, doing in, uh, and in this court, which by the way is composed of supposed trade experts, if the court finds a government uh, policy in question violates some trade agreement, it can impose fines and other sanctions on that government. Put more bluntly, Investor state resolution provides corporations a forum in which they can attack and try to roll back whatever nation's food safety rules or environmental laws or banking regulations or whatever are the strongest at any given moment on the grounds that they create an unfair barrier to trade. And they'll be able to do this before a panel of people whose concern is trade, not food safety or the environment or consumer protection or whatever. Now, this is not the first time the U.S. has done this. Uh, similar provisions have been included in various bilateral pacts since the North American Free Trade Agreement back in 1994. But including it in a trade agreement with the EU is unprecedented, and it gives the lie to the claim purpose of, of investor state resolution, which is to protect companies from dictators or weak court systems. Instead, it reveals the real purpose of these provisions, which is to formally place corporations on the same legal level as national governments. Keep reminding yourself, these people are not on your side. And that's an outrage. We're taking a break.
And we're back. And uh, what I just told you about um, they're not on your side. Here's another way I'm going to talk about that. I haven't taken privacy in a while, but I'm going to, going to spend some time here talking about privacy. Because the thing is, it is at long last. In fact, it's well past time that we stop believing the bold-faced lie that President Hopi Changi has any commitment at all to the transparency he promised when he came into office. He came into office promising the most transparent administration ever and instead has proven himself to be more interested in secrecy and domestic spying than anybody that preceded him. For example, I've talked before about his unprecedented war on whistleblowers, where he has prosecuted more whistleblowers under the 1917 Espionage Act than all previous presidents combined. Uh, that includes the persecution of Bradley Manning, the American hero who dared to tell the truth about U.S. policy in Iraq and other places. Uh, he was arrested. He was held in solitary confinement for month after month after month, which is torture by international standards, by the way. Uh, that was done in an attempt to break him in order to make him give false testimony against Julian Assange so that the White House could destroy WikiLeaks. When that failed, he's now before what amounts to a kangaroo court in the military. The government is building a wall of secrecy around this, around this trial. There are secret witnesses testifying in disguise in secret locations. There are secret dry runs of future court proceedings, which even the prosecutors admit is unprecedented. And the government is engaging in the petty refusal to provide transcripts of the public parts of the trial, which makes accurate reporting of what's going on difficult. And now, just recently, we have the trifecta of scandal, scandal and scandal and scandal, or at least the appearance of it. Frankly, uh, a couple of these so-called scandals I don't really impress me that much, so I'm going to talk about those first. For one, all of the frothing about the scrubbing of the talking points about Benghazi, uh, it really fails to impress me. It really does. Uh, for one thing, the deaths of U.S. diplomats is hardly unprecedented. Between January 2012 and September 2008, 60 U.S. diplomats were killed uh, overseas, including 12 in Karachi in 2002 and 16 in Yemen in 2008. None of these cases, as far as my memory serves, produced the wailing, rending of garments and gnashing of teeth that this one has. What's where the memo itself and all the talk about the scrubbing of the memo, what this amounted to literally was the State Department and the CIA each trying to preemptively blame the other for any screw ups that came out later. And it, I mean, it's clear that the administration was, as the term of art has it, less than forthcoming in the days about what it knew, uh, days immediately the following the attack, about what it knew and when it knew it. But, uh, and there are questions about the routine, the normal level of security that was available at the consulate in Benghazi. So there are some legitimate questions to be asked. This memo ain't one of them. And another one that doesn't impress me is this business about the IRS supposedly targeting teabagger groups. Now, I got to tell you that a few days ago, I would have been right there with everybody else about how outrageous it was that the uh, IRS is using political criteria to judge groups. But the thing is, the more I learn about this, the less of an, oh my God, it appears to be. First, these were not criminal investigations. These are investigations of eligibility for 501c3 and 501c4 tax exempt status. Obtaining and, uh, and maintaining that status requires that the primary focus of the group involved be social welfare. Political activities are strictly limited. Second, there was no targeting of teabagger groups. The idea was that a group with Tea Party or uh, a Patriot in its name um, should get a closer look because the names raised a reasonable possibility that their primary focus was political activity rather than social welfare. And third, Tea Party and Patriot were not the only triggers that were used for closer examination. Lois Lerner, who heads the IR division that oversees tax-exempt organizations, noted that only there were 3,400 applications for 501c3 or c4 status in 2012. Only 300 of those were selected for closer examination. Only a quarter of those involved Tea Party or Patriot. 
And last but not least, if this was an attempt to punish political enemies, it was a damned inefficient one. Lerner notes that of those 300 cases, 150 of them have already been closed, and while some groups withdrew their application, not one group has had their tax-exempt status revoked. In reality, the whole thing was an attempt by the IRS to find a way to deal with the skyrocketing number of um, applications for this tax-exempt status. Now, the method they chose, well, or more accurately, this part of the method they chose, well, I was going to say it wasn't the best idea, but actually it was, it was just stupid. It was just stupid. It was a lousy way to do it. But try to turn this into some vast conspiracy to punish political opponents is nonsense. In fact, the buzzword of fairly recent vintage is optics, which refers to the idea that what something is is less important than what someone can make it appear to be. This really is an example of just that. Which brings us to the third scandal of recent weeks, and this is the real one. The AP has learned that the Justice Department secretly obtained two months of telephone records for reporters and editors of, of AP, Associated Press. For April and May of 2012, the Justice Department got lists of all outgoing calls for both the work and personal phone numbers of individual reporters, the general AP office numbers in New York, Washington, and Hartford, Connecticut, and for the main number of the AP in the House of Representatives Press Gallery. In all, it covered, this order covered 20 separate phone lines assigned to AP and its journalists, including general office numbers used by a, about 100 different reporters, plus an office-wide shared fax line. AP President Gary Pruitt called it a massive and unprecedented intrusion into how news organizations gather the news, far beyond anything that could be justified by an investigation. And he was hardly alone in that. The ACLU, the Electronic Frontier Foundation, uh, the New York Times, the Washington Post, other journalists, they use terms like unacceptable abuse of power, terrible blow against freedom of the press, outrageous and shocking. Even Democratic stalwart Senator Pat Leahy, who chairs the Senate Judiciary Committee, said, quoting, I am very troubled by these allegations and want to hear the government's explanation. Even some goppers got in on it. Uh, Representative Darrell is a jerk, and Senator Rand Paul both criticized the intrusion into the press. Lo, and even the word Nixonian was heard in the land. The government wouldn't say it wanted the records, but the belief is that it was another whistleblower case. This one looking for the source of an AP story on May 7, 2012, which revealed some details of a CIA operation in Yemen that stopped a plot to put a bomb on an airliner headed for the United States. A story which, by the way, which AP obtained and then deliberately held off publishing until the day before the White House is going to talk about it itself. Uh, put more directly, this investigation of the AP grew directly out of this White House's continuing drive to achieve complete control over, the, over what the public does and does not know about what this administration is doing and when they know it. Frankly, I wonder how long it'll be before they finally just cut to the chase and propose establishing a ministry of truth. And the thing is, the, the Obama gang can't even be trusted to follow its own rules. The Department of Justice has regulations about obtaining the telephone records of journalists. Those regulations require, quoting, all reason reasonable attempts should be made to obtain information from alternative sources, and that, quoting again, Negoti negotiations with the media shall be pursued in all cases in which a subpoena to a member of the news media is contemplated. What's more, a subpoena to the media must be, quoting, as narrowly drawn as possible, and quoting again, should be directed at relevant information regarding a limited subject matter and should cover a reasonably limited time period. None of that happened. But that didn't matter to Eric Holder, the man who leapt to uh, do an investigation of the inappropriate behavior of the IRS in thinking that uh, politically oriented right-wing groups might actually be politically oriented. Instead, he insisted that he knew everything was on the up and up in this case, and he did it at the same press conference where he did his best Sergeant Schultz impression and claimed that he had recused himself from the investigation and had chosen not to be fully informed. They can't even be trusted to obey their own rules.
Not when there's secrecy fetish is involved. And the other thing is, you have to bear in mind, the flip side of government secrecy is always, always government knowledge. Us knowing less and less about them, and then them knowing more and more about us. You want to know how bad it's getting? I'll give you an idea. In response to a Freedom of Information Act filing, the ACLU, just this month, obtained documents on Justice Department and FBI policies, which showed the feds believe they can read your emails without a warrant. And we're advising agents of that over two years after a federal court said, no, the Fourth Amendment applies to emails. You have to get a warrant. So they're simply ignoring the courts, but that's just a holding action. According to documents obtained in April by the Electronic Privacy Information Center, the Obama administration has authorized a new government program involving intercepting internet communications, part of which involves promising telecoms that the government will not prosecute them if they violate U.S. wiretapping laws by handing over this information illegally without the required warrants. And that is... They're not even going to worry about warrants anymore. The government is just going to ask for the information. The corporations will give it to them illegally, and the government will just say, we're not going to prosecute. How much more blatantly corrupt can this be? And the surveillance authorization, the, uh, the legal basis for which, of course, is classified, it's quite broad in this case. It covers all critical infrastructure, which includes the military, engine, uh, energy, uh, health care, and finance. Now, if you think I'm being paranoid, just remember, as the bumper sticker says, just because you're paranoid doesn't mean they're not out to get you. The extent of government intrusion into what we like to think remains our private, or at least not our overtly public lives, has become astonishing. Tim Clemente, a former FBI counterterrorism agent, has twice asserted in recent weeks on CNN that no digital communication is secure. Not only can the government actively monitor any of our digital communications, including phone calls, emails, online chats, and all the rest, but that communication is stored, held for later access by government agents. Now, if that sounds incredible, bear in mind this is not the first indication of this. 2007, former AT&T engineer Mark Klein revealed that AT&T and other telecoms had built a special network that allowed the National Security Agency, the NSA, to unlimited access to all of their customers' emails and phone calls. 2008, two NSA employees said they witnessed and even participated in the, uh, the inter interception of hundreds of personal, even intimate calls from American service members. 2009, government intelligence officials told the New York Times that the NSA had engaged in what they called significant and systemic overcollection of domestic communications of Americans. 2010, the Washington Post reported that the NSA was intercepting and storing 1.7 billion emails, phone calls, and other digital communications every day. In 2012, NASA official turned whistleblower William Binney estimated that the NSA has 20 trillion records of phone calls, emails, and other data from Americans, including copies of almost all emails sent and received by Americans. Also in 2012, Senators Ron Wyden and Mark Udall said Americans would be stunned to learn what the administration thought it had the legal power to do under the Patriot Act. Remember what I said earlier about how in same-sex marriage, on that one we're winning? Well, in this one we're losing, and we're losing badly, and we're running out of time. I'm just going to leave you with one quick reminder. As of May 14th, there have been at least 4,094 Americans killed by gunfire since Newtown, 32 of them in Massachusetts. You have the best week you can. We'll see you next week.